Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Lynch from the Stella Institute in Annapolis, Maryland. And I'm just gonna cover some of the risks of stellate ganglion block uh, that we go over every time we perform a block here at the Stellate Institute and we take our time and cover all the risks so that all our patients know exactly what is going to happen and what are the potential risks or complications uh, before we sign a written consent and move forward. Um, so the important thing is that the stellate ganglion block has been around for 100 years and was performed safely without any imaging like an ultrasound or any other fancy machinery by just touching a bone in the neck and following that with a needle and injecting a local anesthetic in the side of the neck. And it had been performed like that since the 1920s and, and for, for 80 years on thousands and thousands of people safely before we were lucky enough to have ultrasound to guide us to what we're doing. So uh, the risk of the procedure is extremely low as you can imagine based on that alone. Even still, there's always some risks that can happen. So. Um, Any time that we're going to uh, introduce a needle into the skin, there's a risk of pain, bleeding, or infection. Um, but we use a tiny little needle, a lot like either a COVID or a flu shot, and the risks of those things are about the same. So maybe you need a Band-Aid uh, if there's a little bit of bleeding, but many times people don't even need that. And the biggest question people ask about is, about is how much it hurts. And I, I would say that the vast majority of people are, are surprised and shocked at how it just doesn't hurt or there's minimal amount of pain or discomfort associated with it. Um, it sounds like that wouldn't be the case, but afterwards, almost everyone that I treat uh, with a stellate ganglion block looks around and says, that's it. And they're a little bit shocked that that's it. And it feels a little bit weird, seems to be the word that people describe all the time. But aside from that, it's really not painful. What we do is take our time and examine under ultrasound what the anatomy looks like before doing the procedure to mitigate any risks that, uh, that we could avoid. So we're, we're lucky to have a technology that allows us to see blood vessels very clearly and under live ultrasound we're able to guide or steer our needle right into the target very simply. That alone mitigates risks. There are some people who perform this procedure using a different machine called fluoroscopy which is like a large x-ray machine. Um, that does not allow you to see blood vessels, so there's um, slightly different risks associated with that procedure. Um, the important thing to know about that is that within the neck, there's a large amount of anatomic variation. And just like everybody's face looks different on the outside, everybody's neck looks different on the inside too. There's little variations on where blood vessels uh, travel and where they can be found. So uh, we think it's very important to look at all that ahead of time, take our time and map out the easiest way to the target which is simply a nerve called the cervical sympathetic trunk that lies adjacent to a muscle deep in the neck. Um, but it's very easy to locate under ultrasound guidance. And as long as you can see what you're doing clearly under ultrasound, which you can, in your experience, you can steer the needle there very care carefully and easily with very little risk associated. There's really minimal pain and discomfort. So uh, in our opinion, we don't think it's necessary to be sedated at all. In fact, um, I believe the risk of sedation actually makes it uh, a little more dangerous. And we rely on being able to talk with our patients for feedback um, that allows the, the procedure to remain safe. So what that consists of then is um, the risk would be of damaging any structures as we're proceeding, but if there's anything that's uncomfortable and the patient is not sedated, then you would, you would be able to tell me if something were bothering you, such as saying, ouch, or flinching or something like that. If you're sedated, I can't see that. So. Um, this is very rare, and while watching the needle, I can generally avoid anything that's uncomfortable. But the one real benefit that we have for it is one of the risks of the procedure would be to uh, cause a seizure if we were to inject a volume of the medication, which we use ropivacaine, into a blood vessel. Uh, what that could do is cause a seizure by traveling to the brain. Um, this is a significant risks that we're prepared to handle if it were to happen. But what we do to mitigate that risk is map out all the blood vessels, like I, like I said, which again are, are very obvious and light up in color while using Doppler ultrasound. And then we inject very, very slowly a small volume of fluid, a little bit at a time, and then ask you how you're doing, how are you feeling? And most patients will just say, fine, or give me a thumbs up. And then I'll do that again very, very slowly in a very slow amount of injection, a very slow amount of propivacaine, a little bit at a time, and people tolerate that very well. If something were uh, unusual or there were 
some injection in a vessel, people would feel something immediately abnormal, like the room is spinning. And by knowing that, we're able to avoid or, or mitigate that risk. So that's a critical thing that we do. And again, um, the procedure can be done very quickly. It's a simple thing to do, but we like to take our time here and or no rush, just take our time and do it nice and slow. The other risk of the procedure would be of damaging something to include even puncturing a lung that's been described. Uh, if you are experienced and you know what you're doing, that's pretty avoidable. You'd have to be way off base to puncture a lung using ultrasound guidance, but that is described as a risk in the literature, so we always cover that as well. Um, aside from that, the, the procedure is over in just a few minutes and people tolerate it very well. Not risks, but just worth mentioning, I think, are some of the things that you'd expect to see after the procedure. The first is called Horner syndrome, which is actually con confirmation that the block was done appropriately. So the nerves that travel along the side of the neck, once shut down or blocked by the medicine Ropivacaine, will turn off the sympathetic nervous system on that side of the face. So what you'll see is within just a few minutes after the block, some changes in the face that confirm that it was done appropriately or that your body is responding appropriately. That includes your pupil being smaller, your eye being bloodshot, and your lid being droopy, as well as your nose being stuffy, and your sinus is feeling somewhat full or, or a sense of warmth on the side of your face. So we always check for that and score it afterwards um, while you're still in the, the procedure room. And that just confirms for us the block is working. Now that lasts about eight hours, so it's not exactly a side effect or a risk. It's just something that you should expect after the procedure. The other two things that can be kind of annoying but are not dangerous is after the procedure along the side of the neck, there's some ropivacaine that sits next to the esophagus. So it may make it feel funny when you swallow. Some people describe kind of a um, uncomfortable catching sensation that takes a few minutes to get used to. But once you get used to that, it, it wears off in about three hours. I tell everybody, take small sips and small bites if you're gonna eat or drink, and you'll get used to that in a few minutes. But that can be a little bothersome. The other thing that's less common than that, it's quite rare, but you can get a raspy or hoarse voice afterwards from the block of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which goes to the vocal cord. And all that does is temporarily shut down half of the vocal cords or side of them and give you kind of a raspy voice or even can give you like a helium voice at times. So aside from being very annoying and, and, and kind of irritating, um, that is a benign thing that can, um, will wear off also in a, in a few hours. It's also the reason why we do not do a stellar ganglion block on both sides at the same time. Um, meaning on the same day or during the same procedure, because if that rare occurrence were to happen on both sides, it could actually cause both vocal cords to be paralyzed and that could cause airway compromise. So we would never do that, a block of both the right and the left side at the same time. So I hope that you'll find this helpful in terms of what the risks are and, and I hope that you'll feel reassured because I think some people have uh, concerns and hesitancy about something that actually sounds um, could be a little scary or a little painful and, and are very surprised when it's not. So I hope that helps.